president at uh, WIC-TV, the CBS affiliate here in Madison. And um, I'm here to um, present the um, Commitment to Journalism Ethics Award uh, this year to Dan Flannery from the Appleton Post Crescent. <laughs> I'll spare everyone the, uh, the detailed bio, but let's just say Dan's in his career has been a sports copy editor, sports reporter, sports editor, news editor, assistant managing editor for news, deputy managing editor, editorial page editor, and managing editor. Now he's the Appleton Post Crescent's executive editor. Um, as you might expect in getting promotions like that over the years, uh, Dan's also won a number of awards. He and I met last week, uh, had, had breakfast, and uh, I found out that um, on the ethical side, Dan's first challenge actually came when he was in high school. He played basketball for the Crandon, uh, Crandon High School basketball team on Friday night. Saturday morning, he was uh, the person who was assigned to write the basketball story for the Crandon newspaper that day. So when I asked Dan, I said, Dan, how'd you deal with that conflict? He said, Flannery didn't get near the ball too much. <laughs> As a student at the UW in Green Bay, Dan uh, actually planned to clear a career in broadcast journalism, so the world could have been changed had he done that. But um, he snared an internship at the Green Bay uh, News Chronicle, and one of Wisconsin's more stellar newspaper careers began at that point because he fell in love with that industry. Ethics has always been at the center of that career. Um, he led by example in the newsroom. Uh, early on, he was a sports writer uh, covering the Green Bay Packers, who maybe at the time weren't as uh, good as they are now. And just prior to his first preseason, Lee Rummel, who's a famed Packer PR guy, um, came up Dan and handed Dan two season tickets to the Packers. Now, if you're not from Wisconsin, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, Dan said, Lee, I can't take these. It's a conflict of interest. And Lee said, Dan, everybody takes these tickets. <laughs> well, after that conversation, Lee could no longer say everybody because Dan didn't take them. He then went back to the newspaper, and um, I don't know which level of his boss he told this story to, but as, uh, as he finished the story, the boss looked up to Dan and said, Dan, those are my tickets. <laughs> and Dan's response was, then you can go get them. <laughs> um, the committee which sifted through these nominations for this year's award, and it is an award for um, commitment to journalism ethics, certainly believes that uh, Dan's career, as we talked among ourselves and as we talked to people who nominated him and other people who knew Dan, certainly has that, uh, that commitment in, in many, many ways. Uh, Two recent examples, uh, there was a state of drinking effort by the Gannett newspapers in Wisconsin, and then in his own newspaper they did a story on uh, domestic abuse, which uh, took a lot of that coverage outside the, uh, the normal type coverage you see in these areas and outside the comfort zone. Even Dan admitted some of the coverage is outside their comfort zone. But um, Dan was, had the discussions not only in the newspaper but also in the community about journalism ethics and what it is and getting the readers and getting the citizens to really understand what it is about our industry, what about journalism and ethics that can be said actually in the same sentence. And uh, so it's that type of commitment that, that we've seen and that our committee saw that uh, felt that uh, Dan is a most worthy recipient of this award. Uh, his boss told me, I have not met too many people who are as, as genuine as Dan. He's as honest as the day is long. I am confident that the integrity of my media company and my brand are in capable hands. And there's no question that the Center for Journalism Ethics is putting its commitment to journalism award in capable hands with selection this year of Dan Flannery. Dan? Thank you so much. Um, I told Ellen Foley before that I don't handle these sorts of things very well. That will become pretty self-evident here pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Tom, for those kind words. Awfully nice. Can, can I say one thing? Wendy asked me to keep it short, but I'm going to do this. Can we have a round of applause for Wendy and her efforts in pulling this thing along?
Um, thank you, Tom, for the kind words. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to the Center for Journalism Ethics for uh, sponsoring the award and for hosting the conference. The work that Professor Ward has done and Wendy and everyone else here is uh, shining appropriate and needed light on what we do for a living. And finally, thank you to the panel of judges who selected me as being worthy of uh, this recognition. I understand it was a strong group of nominees, and I'm very humbled. I need to tell you, however, that back in the Fox River Valley, where I'm from, two hours northeast of here, people don't have any idea how you reach this conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> they don't always agree that what we've done as a news organization at the Post Crescent or in, as a larger news organization within Gannett, Wisconsin, uh, we have 10 daily papers in the state and websites, they don't always agree that what we've done has been on the higher ethical plane. And I have to acknowledge an uncomfortable truth about myself. I've made some mistakes uh, in judgment and follow through, timeliness, fairness, openness. I'm human, but I have tried to do the right thing. Uh, in his introduction, Tom uh, mentioned a, uh, an example of low-hanging fruit about ethical behavior, and that's giving the season tickets back. That's honest to God true. Um, every beat writer was offered a set of season tickets. Um, to me, that was kind of a no-brainer. To my publisher, it was a no-brainer uh, in the opposite way. But <laughs> that, was in, uh, that was in 1981, and that's when ethical guidelines and even the unwritten ones seemed a little bit clearer and the ethical minefield was maybe a little bit uh, less cluttered. Things have changed, right? Um, all of us here are co-conspirators and victims or benefactors of the change and what we've seen driven by the technology of the day. Uh, and filtered through all the uh, philosophical and intellectual prisms that we never knew about before, puts ethical dilemmas at our door or in our inbox or on our smartphones a lot faster and a lot more frequently than ever before. Here's a pretty recent example of how that came to pass in our shop. And Tom mentioned it before. We did a, uh, we spent a lot of time and talent and resources on that, on a, domestic homicide case two years ago in uh, 2009. Appleton firefighter uh, shot his estranged wife three times in the head in her driveway. Um, it was a case that uh, killed her. It was a case that really shocked our community. Over the next couple of months, uh, we really took a deep dive into the story of that relationship, how it began, how it flourished, how it fell apart, how it ended, in a way that we'd never done before. Uh, we called the series A Gathering Storm, and it was unlike anything we'd ever done. I mean, usually in a case like that, we do typical trial coverage, right? Uh, but this was detailed and nuanced and full of public documents. We, because he was a firefighter, we made open records of requests for emails that came from his uh, work email account. Uh, had a lot of on-the-record sources, all on-the-record sources, who spoke at length about how things went from great to god-awful in this relationship. And we caught a lot of flack, um, mostly from readers who were very uncomfortable in seeing the kind of detail that we offered. We were accused of sensationalizing or just wanting to sell newspapers or lacking compassion or lacking ethics. In my view, exactly the opposite is true. We could not sensationalize this case more than it already was. It, in, in every way, it already was a sensational case. Did we want to sell newspapers? Absolutely, we wanted to sell newspapers. That's why we have a price on the front of the newspaper <laughs> every day. But in this case, we wanted to sell newspapers for a different reason. This story, this tragic story of a couple, was one that touched dozens of lives, and the warts and all presentation that we gave to the story was something that we felt our community really needed to read and understand and relate to. So we did it. Domestic violence touches far too many lives, and we hope that by telling this piece, our readers would relate to that and help. And they did. One woman wrote to me that in reading the series, which is about a four-day series, she was reminded of her late husband, a man she had been married to for over 50 years, and a man she called a sick person for the way he treated her. 
Other women who had been in abusive relationships praised the work as possibly saving lives. To me, that shows we had compassion and that our ethical process had really reached the right conclusion. That's why we wanted to sell newspapers in this case, because what we do matters. We were proud of that work. Then, we're proud of it today. But back to change and, and how that affects our ethical decisions. A little over a year ago, this case had a, a homicide trial for the uh, firefighter. We carried that trial uh, on our website in a, a live stream. And not only did we carry it, but we offer, also offered a real-time conversation using Cover It Live. Some of you may have seen Cover It Live uh, conversations on websites. Uh, hundreds of viewers, including family members of the couple, joined in asking questions, discussing points of interest, suggesting strategies. If you haven't seen that technology at work, you got to. You really have to look at that because it's fascinating to watch consumers of news react to news as it happens. It really kind of puts a different spin on, on what we do. But we never expected this dilemma. The jury for this trial had been brought in from another county, largely because of the, of the attention that we paid to it as a newspaper. It came from Portage County. Right before the jury went into deliberation, two alternate jurors were dismissed. One of them went back to his mom's home in Stevens Point, and she told him that the live coverage of the trial, which she had been watching all week long, was really pretty interesting, and maybe you should take a look at what's going on there. So he did, and he was pretty engrossed. And he decided he wanted to chat with everyone else. So let me, let me get, reset this for us. 30-some-year-old guy who has been sitting on the jurors panel all week long <coughs> wants to discuss the case while the jur jury is deliberating the case. Well, that's a new one. Um, so the editor who was moderating the discussion and, and all the testimony from, the, uh, from online um, called me at home, had the good sense to call me at home to discuss this, and there were several things we had to do. We'd never faced this sort of thing before. First, we had to verify the juror's identity, which we did. Secondly, we had to let the others on the chat know uh, who this person was, and uh, we couldn't fully identify the person. That's what we did to the other uh, chatters, I should say. And then we, in real time, we had to be pretty clear about how far we could go in, in the discussion. But for almost three hours, this alternate juror answered questions about the jury's schedule, their questions, the key testimony, some of his thoughts. And he stuck with it until the jury, people he had spent the week with, delivered the guilty verdict around nine that night. Um, predictably, I guess, we heard from the defendant's attorneys the next day. They had heard about what we had done and they threatened to take action against us somehow. Um, that never came to pass. And again, ultimately, because we had had some experience in, in, in what we were doing, we handled it appropriately. Uh, that's not a scenario that we ever could have forecast, and, uh, and in the end, we add that experience to the recipe that we use every time we're faced with these decisions. But that's a slice of ethical life at a community newspaper in these changing times, much different than anything we'd ever imagined. Um, I suspect uh, not much different decision than the, uh, than the decisions that are made in newsrooms around the world every day, but we're all adapting, right? Again, what we do matters, and how and why we do it matters just as much. Thank you again for this award, and it matters greatly to me. Thank you. <laughs>